Hello everyone. In this video, we will be looking at what Kubernetes is and how it is used in the software world. How it is used to deploy an infrastructure for your application to different cloud providers. So it's a software that takes care of your application deployment and scaling it onto a bunch of computers, which is called a Kubernetes cluster. Those clusters can be made out of physical computers or virtual machines. The basic building block of Kubernetes is a pod. A pod is essentially an application that you put inside a container and that container is then wrapped around a few more things and then collectively we called it a pod. A pod adds a few things on top of container which is labels and annotations. Labels are very useful. They are used by the other services in Kubernetes cluster to pick up what pods they want to work on. So if a label has got a label um, version equals one, uh, that pod will be picked up by that service. Restart policies, termination control, they are very self-explanatory. Security policies and more, you can configure security policies and whatnot in the pod configuration. So how a pod is created? This is the process. We write the code, we package that in the container image, for example, Docker container image. We wrap the container image in a pod, which means that we write the, the, the YAML representation of the pod and we mention that this is the image that we want to put inside the pod and then you run it on Kubernetes cluster. This is a typical YAML for a pod. We mention the API version. Everything in Kubernetes is done through an API and the API server of Kubernetes exposes a REST API that is used to create pods, create, um, uh, do things on cluster, get all the pods that are running on the, on the cluster. And that API is basically the entry point of everything you can do on Kubernetes. The next thing is the kind. Uh, this is the kind of the object we are creating. Obviously it's a pod. Better data gives it uh, a useful information. The name of the pod will be hello pod. Uh, these are the labels that we just mentioned. Uh, this pod will have two labels. One is zone and other one is version. And then, so this is the definition of the pod. These are the things that are basically wrapped around the container. And then under the spec, you have the definition of the container itself. So the name of the container will be this, hello CTR. Image uh, where the container will be created from is uh, provided here. You can have your um, uh, registry configured uh, with Kubernetes and then you can provide your, um, if you provide your account name and then uh, the name of the image and its tag, it will uh, pull that image from there. And then the, uh, what ports you want to expose on the container. And this is the visual illustration uh, inside the pod. You have got this container and the uh, pod adds these things on top. So the process of deployment of a container to uh, a pod to the cluster is you define a YAML, you post that YAML to the API server. Uh, the API server uh, authenticates and authorizes your request because uh, it's an API uh, endpoint. It will it will look at who is sending the request and if you are allowed to do that operation. Uh, then the the YAML is validated. Uh, it checks if the YAML you've created is fine. And then the scheduler deploys. Scheduler is, is another component that, uh, uh, that looks at what pods are ready to be deployed and it schedules them to be deployed on a node which is healthy. That means uh, that has got enough resources available to entertain uh, that pod. So a node can have one or more pods. So the scheduler basically looks at the, the cluster and picks up a node that can handle the workload of that pod. And then the kubelet 
something called kubelet monitors it kubelet is something that is present on the node uh, we will explain that in a bit uh, pod can have multiple containers uh, this is the ip address of the pod and these containers can communicate with each other using the ip and the port that they are they are listening on uh, this is how pods look when they are deployed on a cluster. Uh, we can see that we've got five computers and they all are on different networks. So this one is the network A and node 5 is on network A uh, node 2 and 3 are on network B and node 4 is on network C. Uh, it's not necessary that this will be the case but if this is the case um, and you deploy your pods onto um, one or many nodes from these cluster uh, what will happen is the no uh, the pods will have their own network so say for example if this pod over here is deployed to node 5 and that one is deployed to node 4 and this one is deployed to node say for example um, node 1 right um, the pods will still be able to discover and communicate with each other because they have their own local network. So they are not dependent on the network of uh, the node that they are running on. <clears throat> so what's inside a node? A node has got three things basically. A kubelet. A kubelet is a piece of software by Kubernetes that handles the node uh, being part of the cluster so it registers the node with the cluster and says that this node is actually part of that cluster um, the container uh, runtime which is the process that is able to run um, um, uh, containers like docker container uh, container d is uh, uh, i think it's provided by docker uh, is a runtime that can run uh, that can help run containers uh, on that machine network proxy is a piece of software that handles the networking uh, uh, part of the uh, of the overall implementation this is a worker node basically and we can uh, we can deploy pods onto this node and now we have seen what a worker node looks like now we have looked at what the worker node is what we want to look at now is this image here this is the Kubernetes official documentation. The Kubernetes uh, cluster is divided into two parts. One part is called control plane and the other part is called uh, data plane. The control plane is a bunch of computers from within the cluster that is used to run the services needed for the Kubernetes to function. So if you have say a, a cluster of 10 computers, we can say that three computers from those 10 computers are control plane that means they run the services needed by kubernetes and the remaining seven will run our applications that is the data plane in the control plane we have api api server um, api server is the api that we hit to do anything on the on the kubernetes cluster we have etcd which is the data store where all the configuration that we post to kubernetes is stored all the information about the cl uh, uh, what the cluster is, uh, what pods are there, what deployment controllers we have, um, everything that is related to configuration configuration of our cluster is stored in that data store. Scheduler is a component that schedules new pods onto healthy nodes. So this is all basically the brains of the Kubernetes cluster. The other part, which is the data um, plane is uh, just computers that will run our pods every node has got a, a k proxy and kubelet that we just uh, explained and then the third part in here will be the pods that we deploy to these nodes that run our application okay pods are immutable it means that they cannot be updated uh, they shouldn't be updated the uh, purpose of the pod is to just run the application and if there is something wrong with the application or the pod it will simply be destroyed and a new one will be created they can also be short-lived means that uh, if a pod is doing something uh, that is temporary uh, for example it needs to run a bad job 
and um, the pod will be created, uh, the application, the container will be created, the application will run and when it has done its job, the pod will be destroyed. kubectl is a command line tool. Anything you want to do on Kubernetes cluster will be done through kubectl command. Um, uh, for example, if you want to get all the pods, you just run kubectl get pods and it will give you all the pods running in the running in the cluster. Kubernetes namespaces are a way to partition your cluster logically. So the biggest use case is if you have three, if you want to create three different environments, your development, your testing and production, you can use namespaces. You can create a namespace, namespace with name dev, a namespace with name test and a namespace with name uh, production. Namespaces are also useful if you have multiple applications that you want to deploy on a cluster. So you can maybe create a namespace for e each application. It really depends on what scheme you develop to use namespaces, but they are basically uh, a tool that you can use to uh, logically divide your cluster. Deployment. Deployment is a way to deploy your pods to the cluster. There are many controllers in uh, Kubernetes control plane and one of the controllers is called deployment controller. Uh, it handles a deployment object that we create and it looks at that uh, object, looks at that configuration and um, it makes sure that the, the state of the deployment of the pods mentioned in the deployment object um, is uh, kept all the time as it is expected. Um, or in the Kubernetes way, there, there are two states. There is observed state and there is desired state. Desired state is the state that we mentioned in the, in, in the config and the observed state is the actual state of the cluster. And the deployment controller basically, uh, its job is to make sure that the observed or the actual state is always uh, identical to what we have mentioned in the in the configuration which is the desired state. This is a deployment YAML. The deployment YAML has got kind obviously uh, deployment. We give it a name. Uh, replicas 10 means that it will deploy 10 pods, uh, 10 identical pods and it will make sure that they are up and running all the time. Selector is hello world. So it will pick up the pods that has got uh, a label name app and its value is hello world. Minimum ready seconds is the amount of time that it will wait after creating a pod uh, and, and, and see that it's up and running for that period of time before it goes on and uh, create a new one. Uh, strategy is the deployment strategy. Uh, now we, we have uh, mentioned rolling update and it basically depends on these two things. The max unavailable uh, whose value is 1, it means that when we are rolling out an update, if we have an application running in 10 pods and now we have an updated version of that application that we want to uh, deploy, it will destroy one pod out of those 10 and create a new pod with new application and replace that with the with the new one. And then it will go on to the next one and it will repeat that process for 10 times to replace all the pods. Now if we have mentioned max unavailable 2, it will destroy two pods and create two new ones and replace those two with the new ones. So this is the configuration that, that you can choose according to what your needs are and uh, how it best fits your needs. So you can choose this configuration according to your needs. And then we have template. Template is basically the template of the pod. Uh, for the pod, we have just given it a name, hello world. Uh, so this label is used here to pick up that pod. And then the spec has got the container details. This is the image name. This pod should be open. And then uh, hello pod is the name of the, uh, hello pod is the name of the container. There is something in between deployment and pods. It's called replica set. It's replica set that is actually responsible for uh, scaling and healing, right? And um, uh, this part over here, 
from replicas all the way to min ready seconds is uh, a separate type of object it's called replica set so replica set is basically uh, is 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 a thing that performs the actions required for scaling and self healing now we have seen at develop deployment we have seen at uh, pods uh, we have seen how deployments are used to deploy pods but how about if we want to access an application that is running in a pod that's where service comes in services are used to access our applications deployed to the pod and uh, they have stable ip address stable port and stable dns and the reason for that is we have said that pods are temporary they just come and go and we can't use their ip address to access the applications that's where service comes in it load balances the pods uh, or that are running your application so basically what you do is you you hit the service rather than the pods and the service sends the request to a healthy pod and gets you the response back here on the right we have the yaml representing a service we are creating a service uh, object that will be handled by a service controller metadata is the usual stuff um, in the spec we have the type of the service we have mentioned node port here there are two other service types um, that are used widely that we will explain that in a bit um, and then we have mentioned the port uh, this is the port th where the requests will be sent uh, to the pod and the node port is the port that will be opened by the service to the outer world so here we can see that the service is load balancing between these four pods and the client hits the service here's the selector part of the configuration uh, how does a service know which pods to uh, load balance it depends on the the labels so these three pods have got these the, the labels zone and version and uh, they will be matched and this service will will pick these pods to uh, to send requests there are three different types of uh, services that are widely used cluster ip is the type of service that is used within this within the cluster so you can't access that service from outside the cluster um, if uh, an application that is running in a pod needs to access another application that's running in another pod um, it can hit the cluster IP service that is load balancing the the other application pods and um, they can interact in that way node port we just saw the configuration for it's an uh, it's for outside um, world we can hit that service and uh, it will send the request to the pods and get us response back load balancer type is many for cloud so when you deploy this uh, kind of service onto a, a cloud provider uh, it will provision that cloud providers um, load balancer for example nginx in aws uh, case and um, that load balancer will be um, will be able to load balance your requests ingress ingress is a type of service which can load balance different services so we have said that a service load balances different pods ingress can load balance different services so here we can see that we have created an ingress and there are two services here and uh, so it can read out the traffic based on the routing rules that we define as part of the ingress configuration so here we say that this domain will be sent to that service and this domain here will be sent to hydro service and then it has got also the path configuration that if if request like this comes in uh, we are sending it to shield service and if we have slash hydra in the url then we are sending it to hydra service so ingress is very useful when you want to um, have a common load balancer that can send a uh, request to your different applications now the next thing is storage how uh, storage works and how can different ports access to different storages there are three basic elements there is storage class 
there is persistent volume, there is persistent volume claim. Now, every storage provider implements a plugin, it's called CSI plugin, uh, which is to basically standardize the access of storage from within the cluster. So we create a storage class, which basically defines what the storage is, who is the provider, what kind of storage it is, right? So this is sort of the metadata of the storage and um, we create persistent volume claim that is used by a pod to actually claim the storage. So think of this as a class. If uh, you're familiar with object orient oriented programming, this is uh, the class and that is the definition of an object of the class. And the pod will use that definition to claim uh, its storage and the volume will be mounted onto to pod in the container of the pod. Kind of the object is storage class here. We mentioned the API version. Provisioner is the provider of the storage. Uh, here we are using um, EBS CSI and uh, these other configurations can be looked up in the documentation and you can use the ones that, uh, that you need. Persistent volume claim uh, is the actual object. So we mentioned the name of it uh, that we'll be using in the pod and then uh, access mode read write once there are two more access modes again look in the uh, documentation and see which one you need uh, and then we we say that we need 50 uh, gig of storage right and then the storage class name is fast local which is this one here so this storage will be created based on that storage class and then this persistent volume claim uh, will be mentioned here in the pod definition. Uh, so the, 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 the storage volume will be mounted uh, onto container. The next thing is config maps and secrets. The config maps are uh, just um, key value pairs which are provided uh, in, in form of uh, a YAML configuration and uh, when these are posted to Kubernetes, they will be made available to pods as environment variables. There are two ways you can create config map in form of key value pairs and if you have more values, we can also use this syntax. So config map is used to provide environment related data to pods. So you have different URLs or different database connection strings uh, for dev environment, stage and production. So you can use config maps uh, for each type of cluster to provide these values as environment variables to the applications. How about passwords and uh, API keys and the data which is sensitive? We create a secret kind of object um, to provide those values in the secret configuration, we basically base 64 encode the data and provide that encoded string here. It's not really secure, but it is like one way of hiding the data. Um, and here we can see we have uh, encoded username and password in base 64 and we have created this secret. And if a pod is using data from this secret, it will be the username and password will be available as environment variables and it will be decoded for the uh, for the pod to use and this is how you inject the values from the config maps uh, into the pod definition so we can see the spec in this in the in the container spec we have an env section in which we say that we want to create an environment variable of name first name and the value from uh, mentions that where the value will come from. And then we mention the name of the name of the config map and the key inside that config map. And then similarly here we are mapping the family um, attribute of config map onto the last name. And in the pod, uh, in the container, these values will be available as environment variables. Stateful sets are similar to deployment 
and they deploy pods and they manage the number of pods they are different in one way that they are uh, they create the the pod names in a very predictable way so they will use the uh, the service name there's a scheme that they use to to generate the names of the pod in a very predictable manner so if they for example if they if they have if we have replicas three replicas they will create uh, pod names as for example uh, abc service dot pod 1 abc service dot pod 2 abc service dot pod 3 and if any of the pods um, goes bad it will create the new pod with the same name so what's the use of it its use is to say we want to have a a pod that uh, runs our database and we want to connect to our database we can use the, that pod's name to connect to that database and um, the volume it creates is similar it uh, gives predictable names to the volumes and um, uh, and uh, so uh, those pods the same pods can uh, have the same volumes attached even if the pod goes bad and is terminated and is created again the, the naming scheme basically makes sure that this the, the same uh, pods with the same name attaches to the same volumes okay that's enough of theory let's see everything in action right so i have two applications uh, for a car dealership the car dealership is called jac hypothetical name jac backend is a project which is a microservice that exposes these endpoints and jac front end is a react application that interacts with that back end to get data and save data the back end database we are using is mongodb and we will deploy that mongodb instance onto a separate pod now let's go through the kubernetes configuration here i have a bunch of yaml files i will go through them step by step let's go into the db directory and i have a call and i have a file with name storage.yaml we are looking at here is the secret configuration we mentioned that you can provide secret in form of this configuration yaml configuration i'm using string data attribute here to provide the username and password for the database in plain text but we have mentioned before that we can base uh, encode it in base64 and provide that encoded string here and we can simply use data like that but for simplicity i'm just using string data so this will create a secret object in our cluster the next thing we are creating is a storage class the storage class is a type of storage um that defines a storage that it will be available for uh, uh, for the cluster whenever it's needed um the important bits are provisioner when we say no provisioner it means it is going to provision local storage by local storage it means that it will provision the storage on the node um volume binding mode wait for the first consumer means that do not create any storage until it is requested by a pod right the next thing we create is persistent volume persistent volume is basically the actual storage that is created on the node or if it's um by a storage provider like like uh, amazon block storage um this object basically uh, determines that uh, how much storage will be created and um this storage is made available for us depending on what's the uh, what's the volume binding mode uh, defined in the storage class so this definition here is essentially um where the storage will be mounted uh, what's the uh, reclaim policy uh, it's retain reclaim reclaim policy means that when a container using a storage is terminated what to do with that volume so retain means it will not be deleted even if the container using that storage is deleted 
um, the other important bits are storage claim storage class name we have said that uh, this is the storage class name uh, and this basically tells what kind of storage you are going to provision so no provisioner means that it will be a local storage on the node uh, that it is deployed to right and this here node affinity um, is basically telling that what node to use to create this storage so we are creating this storage on the node whose um, whose role is who has a who has got a label uh, with the name role and its value is jack cos mongodb node right the next object is persistent volume claim now this object is used by a pod configuration and it has to match um, this configuration over here so a pod will say that this is my persistent volume claim it's like a request um, to a persistent volume to get a storage for a pod um, we give it a name jackass pvc storage class name again this is the class name we have defined above um, access mode is read write once this access mode is also used as a label to match the persistent volume claim with the persistent volume here and then the storage uh, it, it needs to match what we have defined in the uh, persistent volume so this will be mentioned in the pod configuration and this will match with the uh, persistent volume and it will be created when the pod requests for the storage for the first time because we have mentioned wait for the first consumer in the storage class the next thing is stateful set stateful set is equivalent to deployment but the only difference is that it will give predictable names to pods in the spec we will mention a service name and i will explain what this service is and what it does in a bit replicas is one we just want one pod running the database selector is uh, what pod to select uh, so this pod we will define at the bottom of the uh, this configuration file and here is the template of the container that we want to deploy so we provide the metadata we give the pod that role uh, which will be selected by the service and then in the spec we have got um, a node selector um, node selector means that this node should be selected for the um, for the pod and then we have got the container uh, definition we give its name images mongo uh, and then these are the environment variables inject being injected into um, into the container we have got the database names its value is hard coded for now for simplicity we've got the username its value is coming from the secret ref um, the secret name that we have created is jackass mongo secrets which is up here so we are referencing that secret as a name here and the key we want from that secret is username that is defined here so that username will be injected into this environment variable similarly we inject password and then we mount volumes the first volume we are mounting is uh, it's called secret volume and the mount path is etc mount db secret and it's a read only you can't update that once it, once it's created and then uh, the second one is mongodb data and mount path is data slash db and this mount path is basically the mount path that we have defined in the in the in the persistent volume and then we specify the volumes uh, that will match these volume mounts the name is um, secret volumes 
and then the secret name we provide is this one here and then the name is mongodb data and persistent volume claim is jacos pvc that we have defined up here in the persistent volume claims now notice that um, what is common between these two sections the volume mounts and volumes if you look at this name here it is matching with that name so what we are saying is mount these secrets onto this directory and if you look at this one here it matches that name and we are saying that mount the pvc that storage onto this directory here and then the next one is a service why we need a service we need a service to get the ip address of the pod we know that this pod is long lived because it has got a predictable name so we create a headless service by headless service what we mean is it is a cluster ip service but we say cluster ip none that means that it will create a service and it will create the endpoints by endpoint means it will have a collection of the ip addresses of the pods that it is load balancing but it will not have an ip address for the outer world to hit it why do we do that we do that to access the ip address of the pod that is running the database so that we can use that in our application to access the database and this service is uh, deployed onto um, uh, and this service basically selects this pod uh, that it will it will be um, load balancing this is all the database configuration stuff it will create one pod and it will host our database mongodb and we will connect to our database from the other pods that will be running our backend services now let's look at the backend services for a minute this configuration file has a bunch of objects that will help us deploy our backend service that will connect to that database the first thing we see here is config map we give it a name and there is only one configuration item in this config map and that is the headless mongo service that we have created as part of our storage yaml file as part of our part of our database setup this one here so the service name can be used as host name for the database coming back to the backend deployment configuration so this is our config map it will um, these this db host will be mapped into the pod that we will see in a second the next thing we create is the deployment object now why this is deployment object because these pods do not have to be do not have to have predictable names they can come and go if uh, because this application is stateless if something goes wrong in the backend application or the pod that it is residing in it can just de be destroyed and replaced with a new pod we give it a name uh, we have said that replicas is only one uh, for simplicity we are just running one replica uh, you can give it two three or how however many you want to run selector selects the pod that it will deploy and then um, revision history limit it can go back five steps minimum ready seconds wait 10 seconds for the newly created pod and then create the next one strategy is rolling update that we have discussed in previous sections um, and then we have got this template here now this is the pod template we are creating a pod with the label called app and its value will be jack be app we can see that this is highlighted here in the selector section of the deployment which means that the deployment will select these pods the next section is affinity section 
affinity section basically helps us to define some rules for example this rule here is node selector terms we say that if a node has got node group of jack b in node group then this pod can only be deployed to that node this is the container definition we have got a name the image where the which will be pulled and container will be created from the env section defines injects the um, environment variables that will be read from either <clears throat> the secret that we have created in the secret uh, object in the storage config uh, let's go back and see uh, these ones here or the this one here that is created in the in the in the jack cause b e config which is the config map up here right username password and uh, db host name will be available for the container as environment variables with these names mongo username mongo password and db host the next thing we are creating is the service so that we can hit the um, pods from the outside world we are calling the name uh, we're calling it jack b is svc type is cluster ip so that we can hit it from outside we will hit the service at port 80 and the target port is 3001 which is um, the port that our container will be listening at and then the selector section selects the uh, name of the pod that it will load balance which is up here in the template we similarly look at the front end application deployment config similarly we have a config map there are a bunch of endpoints uh, these are basically so this is the domain that we'll be using um, for ingress uh, i'll show the ingress configuration in a minute and these are our urls uh, for the back end service that we can hit again the deployment service uh, we similarly uh, push the uh, we similarly define the affinity rules to say that these pods will only be deployed to the nodes that has got node group as jack fe node group and then the container definition is here it is using the same image but it's a different tag so that's uh, that's going to be a different application and this is another way of uh, injecting uh, config map you simply say env from and then you say config map ref and give the name of the config uh, map that you've created so what it will do is it will take all of that and um, inject these as is with the same names into the uh, container as the environment variables and then similarly we create a cluster uh, the service that will load balance the these pods and the port for this application is 3000. Um, the port for the service is same as uh, the backend service, which is 80. Uh, let's look at ingress configuration. Uh, we talked about ingress that it can load balance between multiple services. We give it a name and then we specify the rules here in here ingress class name is nginx is it will load the nginx load balancer uh, when we deploy it to the uh, aws um, now this is the rules so if the host is jackcast.com if the request is coming from this domain then what it will do is it will forward the traffic to jack fe svc which is a front end service that we have defined over here this one here that is load balancing the front end pods and then we have got a uh, another host rule which is jackosbe.com and any request coming from this domain will be forwarded to the back, uh, service for the back end which we have defined over here in the back end and that is uh, obviously load balancing the back end pods ingress controller is not um, enabled or installed by default in the kubernetes cluster so what you have to do is if you want to use ingress you have to install it and this is the command that you can use to install ingress so we will be using that command in a bit uh, to install ingress controller and then 
the last but not least uh, our cluster config so aws provides you a tool it's called eksctl eks basically lets you define your cluster configuration similar to what a kubernetes cluster object looks like so this kind here cluster config is not a kubernetes uh, object uh, it is a custom object that is provided by aws and we can we can basically define everything about our cluster we have the name of the cluster uh, we need the region which is eu west 2 basically london node groups and now we have defined we can get rid of that node group here we don't need that there are three node groups there is jack fe node group there is jack backend node group and there is jack uh, backend db node group and in each node groups we have got the instance type t2 micro for each of them and desired capacity is three uh, for backend front end so there will be three nodes for the backend three nodes for the front end and one node for the uh, database and then the volume size is 10 gig ssh if you want to enable it you can do uh, if you don't want to enable it you, you can simply um, ignore that or remove that i have provided my public key here which means that i can ssh into the nodes if i need to it's generally not needed but it's really up to you and how you want to design your infrastructure of the application right i think we are at a point now where we can run the commands and we can set up the infrastructure for our application let's get into it i will go to command line i'm already in the kubernetes uh, directory which is this one here obviously the first thing i want to do is i want to create my cluster so i will use the uh, the tool that is provided by aws i will say eks ctl create cluster minus f cluster dot yaml what this command will do it will take everything that is written here and it will understand the configuration and uh, it will create all the nodes infrastructure for us and it will give us a, a kubernetes cluster this is going to take a while and i will skip through the process all right it took about 15 minutes and it has created our cluster so going back we ran that command uh, with cluster um, yaml configuration and uh, it created a cluster for us and now if we head over to aws we will search here for eks elastic kubernetes service that's where that's what we are using to create our cluster we can see that we have our cluster created it's active if you go inside the cluster you can see all the resources and all the uh, nodes created in it now if you go to compute you can see that these are all your nodes so for example if i open up the first one i can see things in it the one thing that i want to show you is this thing here so the node group for this node is jack be node group that means that the pod that will contain the backend application will be deployed to this node or any other node that has got the same node group um, other than that there's a lot of information we can see here there are currently two pods running uh, and these are pods that are required by uh, kubernetes uh, to function so at the moment uh, we have six nodes they uh, some of them will also behave as uh, the control plane and uh, the others will um, contain the pods that are running our application right so we go back to cluster and now going back to the command line again the next thing i want to do is i want to first of all create the storage so i want to set up the database first of all so let's go ahead and create the database pod now from here on i will be using kubectl that is a kubernetes command line tool to create everything 
because now we are doing everything inside the Kubernetes cluster. Apply minus F and then the name of the file that we are going to run is storage.yaml. Let's run it. Now here we can see that it has created the secret, it has created the storage class PV, PVC, um, stateless Mongo deployment, which is a stateful set, and then the Mongo service. Now what we can do here is, we can actually look at these things, cube CTL get, uh, let's see the pods first. So we can see that this pod here, uh, Jack cause stateful Mongo deployment zero. This is the name of the pod. And if this pod is destroyed and it creates a new one, uh, it will have the same name. So that's why having the predictable pod names is beneficial in case if you're running the DBs um, on it. We can see the state it's uh, container creating state uh, which means it hasn't been fully created yet it's in the process it will create that in a sec so we'll we'll check the status in a bit now let's see the services cube ctl get svc sorry get svc here we can see there's a kubernetes service that is part of the control plane that is uh, used by Kubernetes to function. And this is our service that we have created, Jackass Headless Mongo service. And we can see that it's cluster IP is done because we don't want an external traffic to hit the service. This will be used from within the cluster for the pods that are running back and application to connect to the database. I think we can get secret. There you go. So it says that we the cluster has created the secret. It has got um, two entries in it, and this will be used by the by the pods, backend pods. Let's get the pods again. We can see it is still in container creating. You can see that our database pod is running. The next step we are going to do is we are going to create our backend pods so we'll simply go kubectl apply minus f deploy backend yaml we can see that the config map is created the deployment is created and the service is created now if i go again and say get pods we can see that there's a backend pod created as well and its state is container creating if i go kubectl get services we can see that there's a back end service also created and it's a cluster ip service now it has got an api so this api can be this cluster ip can be used to hit the service from outside and then cube ctl get pods now we we can see that both our pods are running the database pod is running and the back end application pod is running now the next thing i will do is run the front end file and create the pod for the front end kubectl apply minus f deploy front end and again we can see that uh, now we're going to see the third pod which is the front end pod and kubectl get svc and this is our service that is created for the front end. kubectl get pods again. It is still creating. So we'll just wait for some time and check the status again. Now it's running. And we can see that all three pods, front end, back end, and database are running. Now we have mentioned that we will use ingress that will provision a load balancer provided by cloud provider which is aws and it will um, provision an nginx and uh, we will hit the nginx and nginx based on the domain name will send request to either the front end service or back end service these ones here so let's see how it's, how it's going to happen 
so we will go install ingress so this is the command that will enable or install the ingress controller so what we will do is we'll simply paste that command here and run it it will create everything that it needs to run the ingress controller so we can see that it has created a bunch of stuff that is needed uh, for nginx to run so we can see here it has created the ingress class uh, so what it will do is it will it will provision nginx um, load balancer in aws and then we can apply our kubectl apply minus f our ingress configuration so that our rules are um, put in force kubectl get ingress we can see that our ingress is created and here we can see that it will be handling requests from these two domains uh, jackcause be and jackcause.com now if we head over to aws uh, let me go back again i have i had opened the uh, load balancers we have one load balancer created for us and uh, i need to find the ip for this load balancer so that we can hit it right copy that i will go to network interfaces i will search for that id and then from one of these we are going to get the public ip now how we are going to make use of these domain names uh, i'm going to go to my host file and i will update i will redirect the traffic from these two domains to that ip address like so now if i go to my browser and if i go jackcause.com Uh, maybe there's an application error here if I go to any other URL there you go you have your application running now we know that the front end is working uh, let's try to save some data into the database uh, anything anything and add vehicle uh, Apparently it's saying there is some error, but I think this is an application level error. We can debug by looking at the application. Okay, so apparently there is something wrong with the front end application that we need to debug. But uh, uh, what I wanted to show here was that we have got our application being served from the front end pod. And when we, um, we can actually look at if it's able to save data in the database. Five. Uh, let's see that's the registration number buying date is three description is anything price is anything any number at vehicle and we can see here the request that is sent to jackhorsebe.com slash vehicles which is a post request and the payload is whatever data we entered in the form uh, we got the request uh, the status code as 201 which means that it has created the record in the database at the back end so there you have it this is how you create um, your application infrastructure with just a few commands and you have your um, application up and running in the cloud with no time and similarly if you have your updates for example when i fix this bug i will just run one command i will push the uh, push my image to the docker hub repository or wherever you are hosting your images and then i will just run one command to roll out the updates and it will take the new image and replace all the pods and that's pretty much um, your application infrastructure automated 
and obviously you can look at your uh, configurations and improve them as your as per your needs for example if you want to create a dynamic storage you wouldn't use no provision you for example you want to use the amazon block elastic block storage from uh, by aws so you will mention that provisioner here and there, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can mention here you will have to look at the documentation on what options you can use um, but yeah this was just a quick introduction of what kubernetes is how it can be used to deploy applications to the cloud so now you have your pods deployed to relevant node group nodes uh, if we go here and say if we look at this node and we can see that this has got a front end uh, pod deployed to it which is running and if you look at the node group for this one it's jack fe node group and so it is deployed to write uh, node if i look at this one for example and if i look at the node group this is the db node so the db pod should be deployed here which is this one here so now if you want to delete your cluster because running a cluster obviously it will cost you money and uh, once you have seen that if you are in process of development once you have seen that your cluster is in uh, is working fine and now you want to delete it you will use the same command that you use to create the cluster which is eks ctl delete cluster minus f the same configuration file that you use to create the cluster you will use the same config to delete it and it will delete everything uh, in order so that there are no resources that are um, running on the aws uh, cloud so it will delete when it delete nodes basically it's going to delete everything um, the pods and obviously uh, whatever is on those nodes right so the cluster is deleted as you can see we issued a command uh, right here to delete the cluster and it just went through the same process to delete the node groups and everything uh, the control plane and the other node groups from the cluster and uh, all the resources that were provisioned from the aws they are now released and deleted now if you go back to aws console and if you go to elastic kubernetes service you can see there are no clusters here. Similarly, if you go to load balancers, you can see there is no load balancer. So everything is deleted as part of that command. So, so there you have it. We created an application infrastructure from the YAML configuration and the time it took was not more than 30 minutes this is very useful when you want to roll out updates for your application when you want to manage the uh, your application infrastructure as configuration and let me know about your thoughts in the comments below and uh, i'll see you in the next one